Right, good, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, where, wherever you are. Welcome to this press conference of the IPCC at the end of the 44th session of the IPCC, the, the climate panel, in, uh, which has just taken place in Bangkok. And I'm Jonathan Lin, I'm the head of communications. And with me on my left is Hui Sung Lee, the chair of the IPCC. On his left is Thelma Krug, who is one of the IPCC vice chairs and was also the chair of the scientific steering committee of the scoping meeting for the special report on 1.5 degrees or global warming of 1.5 degrees as it's called, whose outline we've just completed today. On her left is Abdallah Moxit, the secretary of the IPCC, and on my right is Kyoto Tanabe, who is one of the co-chairs of the IPCC's task force on national greenhouse gas inventories, and was one of the, um, the, the chair or the, one of the chairs of the scientific steering committee for the methodology report. Yes, yes. So uh, we'll start off with a couple of um, in introductions and um, then we're open to questions. If you're following this press conference by webcast, you can email us questions on ipcc-questions at wmo.int. That's ipcc-questions at wmo.int. And if you're able to watch this on video, you can see that email address behind me on the slide. So we'll start uh, with uh, a few words from Hui Sung Lee, the chair of the IPCC. Hui Sung, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we have indeed had a very productive uh, week here. Uh, let's recall the uh, circumstances of this meeting. Uh, the policy environment is really changing. In the last few weeks, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change cleared the threshold to come into force on November the 4th, less than a year after agreement was reached. Negotiators agreed on a market-based scheme to reduce the growth in aviation emissions and a revision to the Montreal Protocol to phase down hydrofluorocarbons, a type of greenhouse gas, could, reduce, could help reduce global warming uh, by half a degree. So we can no longer say that the policymakers are ignoring the voice of science. They are ready to act, and they need robust science as a basis on which to uh, formulate sound policy. That is where the IPCC comes in. What we have done this week is firing the starting gun on the first two products of this assessment cycle that will provide that science by agreeing the outlines of uh, two reports. These outlines are the table of contents of the reports, the framework in which the authors who we will start to recruit next month will carry out their work. We have also provided them with suggestions of what could go into each chapter based on the conclusions of the experts of meetings, the meetings of the experts in August who scoped out these reports. But this additional information is indicative and it's up to the authors of each report to decide the exact content of each chapter based on the availability of scientific literature for them to assess. The first of these reports is the official title is Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Celsius, an IPCC special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and related global greenhouse gas emission pathways in the context of strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change, sustainable development, and efforts to eradicate poverty. As you know, this report was requested by the COP21 at the time of the Paris Agreement. It will be delivered in 2018 in time for the facilitative dialogue that will be held this, that year by governments to review progress on the Paris Agreement's goal of limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius while pursuing efforts to hold it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The second paper is entitled 
2019 refinement to the 2006 IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories. This methodology report will draw on the latest science to help governments measure their emissions of greenhouse gases and removals by sinks. Accurate measurements of removals are essential to help governments to monitor the progress they are making under their nationally determined contributions to reach the Paris Agreement warming goal. The IPCC took several decisions on other matters, including partnering with other organizations on holding a conference on climate change and cities, a topic that will be a big focus of our next comprehensive assessment, the sixth assessment, or known as AR6. It also agreed to organize an expert meeting on mitigation, sustainability, and stabilization scenarios, which will provide important input for AR6. The IPCC, the Climate Panel, also agreed to update the communications strategy in the light of our experience with our last major report, known as AR5, and the recommendations of the expert meeting on communications held in February this year. This includes a recognition of the need to consider communications right from the start of preparing a report, giving the authors access to communications expertise, and keeping abreast of the changing media landscape, including social media. The panel also discussed measures to encourage the participation of developing countries in IPCC activities and efforts to reduce the IPCC's own carbon footprint. We expect that the scoping meeting of uh, scoping meeting several months ago and also the uh, panel's decision to adopt the outline of two outlines of two, uh, uh, one special meeting and, and the other methodology report is a very important step toward a very successful uh, conduct of uh, this assessment, AR6. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Hoi-sung. Uh, now I'd invite uh, Thelma Krug to say something about uh, the special report, Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm particularly very happy because uh, I was chairing the Scientific Street Committee that uh, was responsible for bringing forward an outline. <coughs> Sorry an outline for the special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius and to propose it to this panel. And um, I say I'm very happy because we were able to achieve a, a very good uh, result here uh, and that respected very much uh, the scientists uh, pr that proposed the, the outline. As uh, uh, IPCC Chair Hovisung has already mentioned, um, the special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius is started as per an invitation of the Climate Change Convention. And then when IPCC, um, uh, in its previous panel session, addressed this invitation, it said it should be developed in the context of strengthening the global effort to address the threat of climate change, eradication of poverty, and sustainable development. So there was an added, let's say, challenge uh, for the construction of this uh, outline, uh, given the, the broader uh, context uh, of the original invitation from the Climate Change Convention. So uh, the steering committee um, addressed the, the, the invitation and the way the IPCC decided to carry out the work by uh, creating the scientific steering committee who was responsible for putting together scientists. We had a, a basically 85 scientists coming, 51% of which were from developing countries, and also a very good regional balance, <clears throat> gender balance as possible, and also novel people into this process, which is important to, because it ensures that you have a broader uh, coverage and broader views into this coming into this process. So we 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 uh, from the scope meeting proposed uh, 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 the, the scientists proposed in town uh, proposed then a, a a outline. So the outline was brought um, for a decision uh, from this panel, 
and it was very important to see that uh, the panel was very open, very cooperative, the atmosphere was very constructive, and I would say that the final result was not too much of a modification of what the scientists have proposed. So despite the fact that many say that uh, because you have governments, then you bring policy into this. I think it was absolutely excluded from this process. And uh, the outline was approved very much on the basis of the proposal, original proposal, from the scientific community that uh, participated at this COPE meeting. So that is also a very good signal that uh, of the respect beyond what uh, uh, Chair Huesung has already mentioned. Uh, the atmosphere, the, you know, the, the, this vision of moving forward and, and more aggressively towards tackling climate change. I think that uh, the importance of the science to back up this process is being absolutely respected and this is why IPCC is so important into this process. So um, we finally have, it's important also to consider that when uh, IPCC finalized its previous uh, uh, cycle, uh, the fifth assessment report, the science was not so mature or so evolved to provide too much uh, scientific backing for the 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming. And this is why the request comes. We were addressing uh, saying below two degrees centigrade, uh, two degrees Celsius, but uh, specifically, the invitation was for IPCC to focus on the 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius global warming and impacts, associated impacts, impacts, and also uh, how we could achieve this long-term goal. So, uh, what are the potential ways that can lead us? To, to have this uh, 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius um, global warming. So uh, we considered, and I think that it was also uh, con some concern expressed by, by the panel, if the literature has matured and evolved enough since uh, we delivered the, the fifth assessment report, and that there is a broad understanding that yes, uh, there is literature, maybe not enough to cover all the very ambitious uh, suggestions that we have uh, that we have presently in an indicative list of bullets to give guidance for the authors, but obviously it gives also an indication of, of where the scientific gaps lie, may lie, and, and with this help also the researchers to improve and to tackle these, these gaps and, uh, and potentially uh, they being able to be captured in the AR6. So I think that uh, uh, the final result from this, I think it's very important, very uh, constructive, very, uh, I, I think we are going to have a report that will uh, uh, help us address the issue, which is particularly important to the small islands. So we know that impacts of 1.5 are, are already, uh, will be already important for the small islands. And so this is why this, is, this report is particularly important for them. So with this, I will stop here. I just gave you a broad overview of where we stand now, and uh, I will be open for questions. Thank you. Th thanks, Tama. And now I'd like to ask uh, Kyoto to tell us something about the methodology report. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, uh, I'm afraid uh, probably IPCC methodology report uh, that is not very familiar to many people. So uh, let me try to explain what uh, the IPCC methodology report is and also why we need to uh, produce a new methodology report now. Um, one of the key messages of the, the IPCC fifth assessment report was that uh, human influence on the climate system is clear. Then uh, how we humans are influencing climate systems? Typically, by generating by and emitting various gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, etc., that cause global warming, uh, so-called global uh, greenhouse gases, through various activities including energy consumption, agriculture activities, deforestation, waste management, etc., etc. 
In order to tackle these climate change issues, we have to control emissions of greenhouse gases. And in order to do so, we need to know how much of such gases, greenhouse gases, we are emitting as accurately as possible. To that end, we need to, uh, we need to have robust, reliable, scientifically sound methodologies to estimate emissions of greenhouse gases from various human activities. That's why um, uh, we need to produce uh, such methodology and the, the IPCC methodologies are, uh, IPCC methodology reports are uh, produced to provide such methodologies uh, for use by countries all over the world. Under the U, uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, so-called UNFCCC, all countries, all parties are obliged to estimate and report their national greenhouse gas emissions using the IPCC methodologies, uh, or uh, we usually call it IPCC inventory guidelines. And that is crucial to successful imp implementation of the Kyoto Protocol, uh, for example, and also our Paris Agreement uh, in relation to setting and achieving emission reduction targets by, by countries. So that is uh, IPCC methodology reports. But now, uh, already 10 years have passed since the latest comprehensive IPCC methodology report was produced, that was uh, in 2006. 10 years. During these 10 years, there have been scientific and technological advances that enable us to estimate greenhouse gas emissions more accurately. So it is high time to refine the current IPCC methodologies where possible. That's why the IPCC has decided to produce a new methodology report though it is not to entirely revise, but refine the current 2006 IPCC methodologies where possible and uh, where necessary. Uh, in the development of this new methodology report to refine the current IPCC guidelines, IPCC methodology report, scientific and technological advances during these 10 years will be fully taken into account for a wide range of issues, such as use of remote sensing data for verification of emission estimates, estimation of emissions from shale gas production, uh, reservoirs, etc., etc. I believe this refinement of IPCC inventory guidelines uh, will greatly help governments improve their estimates of national emissions of greenhouse gases that will eventually help uh, countries and international community uh, to make progress in combating uh, climate change issues. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Kyoto. And just to say that if you go to the IPCC website, ipcc.ch, you'll find not only a press release on, on this week's meeting, but also the full text of the, of the outlines of the two reports we've just been discussing, glo global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and the, the methodology report. So um, are there any, any, any questions? Um, I see none. Do we have any questions from outside? Not yet. Okay. Well, while we're waiting, and do if you if you're following this uh, press conference remotely by through the webcast, you can email questions to ipcc-questions at wmo.int. So while we're waiting to see if any come in, um, perhaps I'll ask uh, Telma a question. I mean, a lot of people say we've already had global warming of about one degree or nearly one degree. Isn't it already too late to um, cap warming at 1.5 degrees, so why do we need to do this report? Well, when we are talking about we are ready in one degree, well, we think that uh, this one degree, we have to think that this one degree was something that was achieved last year, so in recent uh, times. Uh, and then we had an extremely uh, uh, warm year. When we look at uh, 
climate change, then we have to look at a larger time horizon to say, yes, indeed, we have now reached to one degree global warming. And uh, so if we look from the time frame of 1986 to 2015, the AR5 already identified that we had approximately 0.8 uh, degrees Celsius temperature increase relative to pre-industrial levels. So we have to look careful when we are talking about these comparisons. Well, we, we are already there. Uh, so that was, th this is something that we are absolutely sure that will be addressed in this report. So uh, the, uh, we are expecting to have uh, an important chapter on this particularly element and also looking um, how we can get to the 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius global warming, um, most likely at the end of the century, but we don't mention that, we just say how to reach this global goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And there is quite uh, a lot there that might take us there in present, so this is what we are expecting the, the report to address. Thank you. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, global warming of one point, global warming one point five, and uh, it may give the impression that since it's a special report, that it is a very narrowly defined uh, issues and uh, very narrowly defined uh, disciplines of scientific community may be involved uh, in producing uh, this special report. However. Uh, as we uh, develop the scoping uh, the paper as well as uh, we uh, uh, going through this outline, uh, going through the approval of the outline uh, uh, by the panel uh, and the members, it became quite clear that uh, it is a highly uh, synthesized, highly integrated uh, output and the process itself will become very, very uh, highly uh, integrated. And that, as Thelma Clark just uh, indicated that, the, uh, that we do have an integrated effort by all three uh, working groups, uh, scientists and co-chairs and vice-chairs. That's the uh, first time ever that a special report uh, by IPCC was produced by involvement of all three uh, working groups. So this is a highly integrated uh, process, highly integrated uh, output. And secondly, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, this uh, report will have a very special attention to the uh, implementation aspect of the global responses uh, to the, uh, the climate threats. And in fact, uh, we will have a one dedicated chapter to deal with the uh, strengthening and the impl strengthening and implementing uh, these global responses to the threat of climate change. And third, I want, I want to also emphasize that all this uh, uh, addressing of uh, very, these critical issues related to 1.5 degree warming will be done in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication and uh, equity matters. Again, this indicates that, that this special report is a output of a general, really a integration of all relevant scientific disciplines to answer these very serious questions of uh, global warming of 1.5 degrees. Thank you. Thanks, Wayson. Did you want to say anything? Um, okay. Can I? Uh, sure. See, yeah, uh, when we are talking, uh, it's interesting also to note, what was the added value when the IPCC, the panel in its last session, decided for us to respond to the invitation, but in the context of strengthening the global effort to, to address the, the global warming, sustainable development, eradication of poverty. Well, I think that the outline that we have in front of us makes very clear the importance of the panel giving, us the, giving the indication of how this matter would be addressed. So we have one chapter, of out of five. Chapter two, that will address mitigation pathways compatible with 1.5 degrees Celsius in the context of sustainable development. 
We have then chapter three that addresses the impacts of 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming on natural and human systems. It will go beyond that because we are also talking about impacts on sectors, impacts that are going to be addressed at global, regional, and uh, possibly even local levels. And then, uh, so if we would be addressing only the invitation from the Climate Change Convention, we possibly would stop there. But we stay strength that was given in my vision by the panel and orientation, we have uh, two more chapters. And chapter four is going to address strengthening and implementing the global response to the threat of climate change, where in this particular chapter we are going to say, you know, uh, what is the, uh, the issue? How, what do we need to get to the uh, global goal uh, of uh, 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. And so this is going to address current and emerging adaptation and mitigation options, the pace of the development and deployment of adaptation and mitigation options, uh, all you know, consistent with the sustainable development and 1.5 degrees centigrade. And then if we go to the last chapter, it's the chapter on sustainable development, poverty eradication, and reducing inequalities, where one of the indicative bullets to the authors addresses positive and negative impacts of adaptation and mitigation measures, including response measures and its strategies, economic diversification, livelihoods, food security, cities, ecosystems, technologies. So you see that it's quite broad. I see that these two last chapters respond also to the expectation that the panel has put forward uh, when addressing the invitation from the Climate Change Convention. So I think that it brought richness into this report that is going to be quite important because it gives a narrative that I particularly find very, very important and interesting. Thank you, Thelma. And a reminder that you can email us questions at ipcc-questions at wmo.int. Now we have one question here from Christian Mihach in uh, Chiang Mai. Uh, it's a question for Thelma. Uh, well, two questions, actually. So he says, we already have the Structured Expert Dialogue Report. Why do we need uh, SR 1.5? And secondly, Will 1.5 be possible without negative emissions? Well, if I start from your last question, obviously this is what we are expecting the, the report to address. So, the, so we, I can assure you that we have uh, specific bullet points that, as I said, that these are indicative bullet points. Uh, there is, a, as I said, an absolute concern with the literature being available to address these issues that we indicatively uh, put forward at this meeting. So obviously, when assessing currently emerging adaptation and mitigation options, uh, there, there will be, obviously, a need to explore as much as we have in terms of technologies, either existing or emerging, and this is something that we are expecting, including negative, I would say, uh, emissions uh, methodologies. So uh, I believe that there is a room for this report to explore those as well. Uh, with regard to your first question, I see that there, there are unique features of this special report that are not going to be addressed uh, by the dialogue or any other place. In particular, I see this integration the, the narrative of this special report that brings a very comprehensive uh, way of addressing not only what are the impacts, but also how to get to the 1.5 degrees Celsius in, uh, global uh, warming, and also, uh, as I said, what, uh, you know, how to how to get it. The implementation point of view is going to be quite 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 uh, strong, I would say, in this report as well. So I don't see any other place where all these could be addressed in a single place. The fact that, as Chair Ho Sung was saying, we have the three working groups working together in a unique way. It's a unique feature of this special report. I think that it's going to bring a strength to it that we haven't been able to see in terms of an integrative uh, 
a vision from the three working groups into a single report. Thanks. Did you, did you want to add anything, Mason? No. Okay, so we have a few more questions. I think they're all directed at Tom. Uh, so. Um, so one from Ed King of Climate Home, who asks, what level of focus will there be on geoengineering technologies like SRM? Well, we didn't put any emphasis uh, on any technology. Because when the authors will see this, the guidance that comes out of uh, this panel meeting, they will have an orientation to explore existing and emerging technologies. And also, they, there is a bullet that addresses the pace of the development and deployment of adaptation and mitigation options compared to pathways consistent with sustainable development and 1.5 degrees Celsius. So no, one, it, no technology uh, was singled out from, 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 the, from consideration, let's say. There is, they, they have not been singled out. There is reference to existing emerging and the pace of development and deployment. So I think that report will need to explore what exists, what are emerging, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, what is the pace, so all this, we think that will be duly addressed by the authors, based by the literature that is available, in particular, with a focus on 1.5 degrees Celsius. Thank you, Tama. And another, another question from Robert McSweeney of Carbon Brief, who asks the, the reasoning behind the changes from the, the proposed outline that, was, uh, that came out of the, the scoping meeting in August and, and what has now been agreed. And in particular, why were chapters four and five merged into a single chapter, now chapter four, and the reduction in length of chapter six on sustainable development from an estimated 40 to 20 pages? Yeah, Robert, yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, Obviously, I, you know, being very honest, my perception as chair of the Scientific Steering Committee is that when I look to or when we look at the original proposal, we see that most of the contents have been maintained. We did, as you mentioned, merge chapters four and five because there was a, a perception of redundancy which there was a perception in my vision as well, because one was addressing uh, what and the other one you know, was addressing how, the implementation. So bringing them together, uh, in my vision, will not make a difference because we are expecting to have coordinating lead authors that will deal with whatever, with the what, and, uh, and, and also coordinating lead authors that will lead uh, on, the, on the how. To implement. So uh, it wasn't a challenge and we didn't have too much of a, 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 a let's say, disagreement from the, from the scientific uh, steering group on that regard, in that regard. Regarding the chapter six being reduced from 40 pages to 20 pages, one is because sustainable development is already permeating the other chapters. So there was also a perception of a little bit of a redundancy. And the focus when we came out of the, of the uh, uh, scoping meeting was that this last chapter would be developed, also taking into account the goals of the sustainable de development, the Agenda 2030. And, uh, and uh, so we don't know how much of the literature is gonna be out there, but anyway, there was also a very strong voice from the, from the small islands that this report should signal the importance of addressing, in particular, impacts and, uh, and the way to get to the 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. And so, in order to demonstrate this focus more clearly, and because also the governments were asking the panel was asking for us to produce a small, a small report. They don't want to see a bulky report because it, it comes at a moment when we are also going to have uh, other reports. So they want something succinct, objective, 
and that provide the policymakers with the appropriate guidance for them to be informed and to act. So, uh, the, the, so the reason was this, a strong plea from the small islands that the, this report should be focused on impacts in particular to give the right message to, um, to policymakers. Yes, please, please do. Yes. I think the, uh, uh, as a result of that adjustment, uh, uh, mer the merging of chapter, was, was it four and, uh, four and five, four and five uh, it really produced a much more sharpened focus. Yeah. At the same time, uh, it uh, gave more strength to the implementation aspect uh, of this uh, special report. And uh, in that way, uh, this uh, revised uh, outline uh, after the uh, thorough review of panel members uh, improved the IPCC's uh, the mandate of providing a policy relevant but not policy prescriptive uh, assessment uh, to the policy makers. I think it is a uh, progress uh, from the uh, scoping uh, paper. Thanks, thanks. Um, now, a question from Alistair Doyle in Oslo of, of, of Reuters. Um, on current trends, is it likely that the world will overshoot the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit and have to develop negative emissions technologies to get back down again? If so, is there a risk that governments will keep on emitting greenhouse gases in the hope that they will be rescued by the new technologies that have not yet been invented? <laughs> well, yes, thanks uh, uh, again for the question. Uh, I think that I have already addressed uh, what we have in terms of expectations. We don't want to prejudge the findings of this report. I think that we will have to wait to see what solid literature is out there now. And also, uh, we see this as, a, as, evolving, uh, as, a, as an evolving work. Why do I say evolving work? Since this report will have to be delivered by 2018, end of 2018, we will have to base ourselves on the literature existing even before that. So I would say 2017. But then we cannot forget that we have two other special reports on the way, on oceans and cryosphere, and the other in, 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 in terms of uh, terrestrial uh, ecosystems. It's a larger um, name for that report. Let, let me say land report, to be brief. And that uh, we expect also to, uh, to pick up from uh, the literature that has evolved since we, uh, this special report on 1.5 from 2018. And also, as AR6 progresses, we will also be able to provide more substance in terms of, uh, of findings, uh, because we are absolutely sure that the, the literature will evolve and will allow us to be more accurate and more comprehensive reducing the uncertainties to the, to the findings that the, the report will definitely provide. Thank you. And now a question from uh, Svetlana Krakowska of the Ukrainian Hydrometeorological Institute, who uh, says congratulations for the many valuable results at IPCC 44, especially on the 1.5 degrees report. And she asks why we use the phrase pre-industrial levels as plural. Are there many levels? Thank you for your clarification. <laughs> yeah, uh, normally we, we say that we have different levels of different gases as well. So pre-industrial levels, uh, I would say that we, we have levels because you have CO2, you have methane, you have nitrous oxide. I hope I'm providing you with the, the correct answer into this one. Um, I would say so. Thanks, and a question from Rohana Dada in South Africa who says, 
This report strikes me as taking the IPCC into a dramatically radical space compared to the very cautious approach it's had to take over the years. Given the high political economic charge around the concept of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, I imagine there's a high likelihood of political interference, if not at this stage, quite possibly once the results start coming in, and I guess depending on the results. How is the IPCC intending to manage potential conflict between scientific reporting and political containment? Well, as I said, you know, in, when I was providing my vision, I, it was very interesting to see that there was a very political interference. If you look at the results of this scoping of the outline that we have to the report, it's very much the reflection of what we had from the scoping meeting very, very little concern. And even, you know, some of uh, the political language was avoided when, when it came in very punctual cases. So that was very interesting to see, uh, to see how the political language was completely avoided from the construction of this report. As you know, uh, IPCC, when it has its product, it's politically neutral. It is relevant, but it's not uh, prescriptive. And I think that we have been quite successful in producing products with that vision and ensuring the importance from the essentially scientific point of view. I am very confident that this report will not be an exception to that rule. So we expect to deliver to the expectation of how the science uh, can provide uh, information to the policymakers, but I don't see the interference at this moment. I think that indeed governments have demonstrated this very clear at this meeting. Yes, I understand the other question. And uh, uh, again, I, I want to remind you that the IPCC, uh, not only in this special report, but also in other reports, including methodologies and uh, our regular reports, we are to assess scientific literature to find our uh, horizons of knowledge with regard to the climate science impacts, vulnerabilities, and response measures. As a result of that, uh, very clear, solid scientific uh, uh, assessment of scientific literature, we uh, should be able to uh, help policymakers with the assessed knowledge about the climate science vulnerabilities and response measures. Thank you. And uh, we have one, our last question, which is a second question from Ed King of Climate Home in, in London. Um, do you think the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere needed to hit 1.5 degrees will be reached before the report is published? And the report will be published in 2018. No. Because as I said, you can, you can see the 1.5 being reached in specific years. So you may, you may have in few years some very high temperature that would, uh, that would lead to this uh, increase. But as I said, when we are talking about climate change, when we are talking about the global goal of reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming, we don't mean that this is going to be something in a few years. We are meaning that we are taking into a, a, series, a, a time series of minimally 30 years to see if this is the trend that you have. So uh, I think that I, I hope I have responded to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. And any further comments from the, from the panel? Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. A reminder that you can, um, that you can find a, a press release and the outlines of the two reports on our, our website. And the recording of this press conference will also be available <coughs> on our website. So thank you very much for, for joining us, and we look forward to being with you again soon. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.